You're listening to Gender, A Wider Lens. I'm Stella O'Malley, a psychotherapist in Ireland. And I'm Sasha Ayad, an adolescent therapist in the United States. Since 2016, my practice has been exclusively dedicated to gender questioning teens and families impacted by gender dysphoria. I also work with gender questioning teenagers and I facilitate at support meetings for families and individuals who have been impacted by gender issues. We're curious about the concept of gender and how it's unfolding in the wider culture. Join us as we look at gender through a wider lens. If you've ever asked yourself, how is this happening? Why are so many institutions completely captured by contemporary gender beliefs? How are medical bodies, educational institutions, and courts operating in ways that seem, well, crazy? Then you really need to listen to this insightful and clarifying discussion with Dr. Lior Sapir. Sapir is a fellow at the Manhattan Institute. A driven researcher with a PhD in political science from Boston College, Dr. Sapir previously completed a postdoctoral fellowship at the Program on Constitutional Government at Harvard University. His academic work, including his dissertation on the Obama administration's Title IX regulations, has investigated how America's political culture and constitutional government shape public policy on matters of civil rights. Similarly, at the Manhattan Institute, Dr. Sapir applies his knowledge of political theory and American government to policy issues, homing in particularly on issues of gender identity and transgenderism. His inaugural essay in the winter 2022 issue of City Journal explores a series of recent court rulings surrounding transgenderism, demonstrating how bad ideas translate from fringe academic theory into law and policy. Previous web pieces for City Journal have explored evolving athletic guidelines and media coverage surrounding trans issues. He discussed these pieces in a recent episode of City Journal's 10 Blocks podcast. In our conversation today, Lior asserts that collapse of liberal optimism has brought about a kind of mindless apathy and subsequently soft despotism. Dr. Sapir makes the razor sharp observation that being non judgmental is our new civic religion. We talk about institutional capture, whether the courts are the best places to decipher complex social issues and what the impending medical malpractice lawsuits will mean for gender medicine. We also discuss the difference between the U.S. system and systems in other progressive European countries, where a reversal of affirmation medicine seems to be taking place. We get into so much here, political philosophy, the virtue of tolerance versus apathy, and what's at stake when members of a society begin to lose their sense of engagement and responsibility to one another and to truth itself. We hope you enjoy our conversation with Dr. Lior Sapir. Hi, Stella. I'm very excited about our guest today. Hi, Sasha. Yeah, this is going to be a good one. Welcome, Lior, to the show. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Maybe we'll start by asking, how how did you first become interested in gender? And what what brought you to be sitting in front of us talking about it? Um, So... My background, I'm a political scientist, and my background is in American government and political theory. And um, I had just finished my comprehensive exams in my PhD program in 2016. Um, I think it was the exact same week that the Obama administration handed down, um, seemingly out of nowhere, this Dear Colleague letter. Um, So this was the Department of Education's Office for Civil Rights, circulated this letter among um, uh, American schools, basically saying, you know, as a condition of receiving federal funds, you must treat students in accordance with their gender identity um, rather than their um, biological sex. And, you know, I was looking for a topic to write about. I had been uh, interested in in the Title IX um, question for for a while, um, but this just struck me, as it did many Americans who were paying attention, as being totally out of left field. Um, Because, you know, unlike other civil rights movements, black civil rights, um, women's rights, gay rights, um, you didn't have decades or even centuries of kind of social movement building and agitation leading up to this. Um, This was a revolution that came from uh, from elites um, through institutions and that was kind of just introduced to the public as a done deal. Um, So I wanted to understand how this kind of new regulatory 
reality could just emerge out of nowhere and what that tells us about American government, about how American governing institutions work nowadays. So I wasn't really interested in the gender topic per se. I, was, I wanted to use the trans, um, uh, trans regulation in education um, question in order to, uh, as a lens through which to understand American government. But um, as I'm sure both of you can sympathize, if you get even uh, an inch deep into the stuff, you get sucked into it immediately because it's, it's first, it's just objectively fascinating. Um, it, it raises a lot of very interesting philosophical questions that go to the heart of what it means to be human, what it means to have relationships with other people. Um, but also uh, it touches on very complicated but very interesting questions of medical science and medical ethics. There's just, uh, there's so many different intersecting questions here um, that, uh, you know, so I finished my, my dissertation in 2020 I immediately did a postdoc. Um, I was still thinking about this as a political scientist, and I still do today. But um, around 2020, you know, I had been f somewhat familiar with the medical literature, but around 2020, I, I really started getting sucked into the medical literature itself. Um, and, and I just realized that, that there's no there there, um, and that we were running this kind of uncontrolled experiment on kids um, with semi-plausible rationales behind it, to be sure. Um, and so that, that's kind of how I, I became engulfed in writing on the actual topic of the medical science and, and the regulatory questions behind um, uh, youth gender dysphoria. Okay, so in hindsight, was it indeed a good lens to help you understand the way government operates today in America? Or did you discover that this gender issue is actually so unusual in how it operates that it doesn't help us understand the broader issues around government. Uh, the answer, as an evasive scholar, uh, I should I should give is is a little bit of both, right? Um, there's things that are unique to the um, to gender identity regulation in the United States, and there are things that are um, quite common to other forms of public policy. Um, so, without getting too much into it, because I, I I don't want to bore the listeners with details about administrative law. Um, but, um, you know, since the 1960s, the American political system, uh, it's basically a story of uh, uh, distrust of governing institutions, of setting up these so-called public interest advocacy groups as watchdogs over the normal um, uh, regulatory institutions and, um, and even institutions on the ground, including public schools. Um, that's kind of the model of how American politics works these days, um, that these public advocacy organizations like the ACLU, for example, have, have an enormous role um, in shaping uh, public policy. And so I think that, it, uh, that that's not necessarily unique to transgender regulation, that you see that in environmental policy and, and other aspects of uh, education policy and criminal justice policy. Um, but here, I think it has had dire consequences in particular, because these organizations are, number one, almost by definition, staffed by ideologues. I mean, you know, who's going to go to the transgender law center? You know, cautious um, medical doctors who are just going to follow the evidence wherever it takes them? No. Um, transgender activists are going to go to that organization, right? Um, people who have a very strong um, uh, ideological leaning on this issue. Um, so, you know, Almost all of these issues in the United States, whether it's um, what schools have to do, what clinics have to do, uh, end up in the courts. We judicialize everything here. Um, you know, Americans love to have their day in court, and we're known for, for the prolifer proliferation of lawsuits. We, we litigate everything to death. Um, and uh, you know, kind of one of the major topics of my writing has been the, the, the way in which courts are actually not very good institutions um, for making sense of these complicated social science and medical science debates. So the fact, so you take those two facts together, right? The fact that on the one hand, our, our political system is set up to um, empower these advocacy organizations that are staffed with ideologues and totally unaccountable to voters, right? Nobody votes for uh, the leadership of the ACLU, um, totally unaccountable to voters. Um, the fact that these organizations have outsized influence in shaping public policy. Um, and then on the other hand, um, you know, the, just the fact that, um, I lost my train of thought here, <laughs> but in any case, it, 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 
it, it's a unique story in some regards, but to those who study institutions and the policy process, uh, it, it's really not that striking. It's not that bizarre that something like this would happen. Can you just go back to, you said courts are actually not a really great place to ferret out these complicated issues. Can you explain why? Yeah, sorry, that was the other thing. That, oh, great. That I lost track of it. Um, good. No, I'm Therapists glad, I'm glad. are very good at like bringing yes. people back to yes. the point. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, so, I mean, there's a few things that, that uh, should be said here. Number one, and I think maybe the most important thing is that um, judges are generalists. Um, they, you know, you don't have a judge, some judges specialize in things like, you know, labor law or environmental law, some things like that. But, but in general, judges are, are generalists and they hear a very wide range of cases. They don't have time to master the details of, uh, you know, for example, the science of, of pediatric gender medicine. They just don't. Um, so number one, you know, by definition, allowing courts to resolve these debates is um, having non-experts decide among the competing view of experts, which already in and of itself is a problem. Um, number two, judges are constrained, unlike, you know, uh, legislator, legislative um, officials like people in Congress, unlike bureaucrats in places like the Department of Education, Judges have to respond when plaintiffs f f uh, file a properly filed um, petition to the court, a properly filed lawsuit. They have to. And that means that, um, you know, the, the people who are going to represent a particular side of the debate are not necessarily the people who actually represent the, the comprehensive uh, analysis of the science or who represent, you know, the run of the mill cases of, in this case, people who transition or detransition. Um, it's just whoever happens to get their foot in the door. And if that's, you know, an ideological ACLU lawyer like Chase Strangio, then that's, th that's the person who is going to represent one side of the debate to the judge, right? So you take already these two facts together, the fact that a judge is a generalist, doesn't have any special knowledge in this area, the fact that a judge has to respond to somebody who is in effect setting themselves up as a representative of a much broader class of people, even though they're not, um, that already very much skews how a court is likely to look at this issue. And then, you know, finally, um, unlike scientific debates, when, uh, when lawyers and judges resolve an issue, they have to go through very formalistic rules of evidence and, and um, decision making. Um, rules that may make sense in the context of a lawsuit, but make no sense at all in the context of scientific debate and discovery. So I'll just give you one example. Um, in a lawsuit, um, you know, if your expert, uh, if, if you want to present an expert with some kind of opinion, um, that expert has to be subject to cross-examination, personally subject to cross-examination by the other side. Um, but we don't have a similar norm for, for scientific debate, right? Let's say I write a really good, compelling um, evidence review paper on pediatric gender medicine, and then the next day I die. Um, you know, the fact that I'm not there to defend my paper um, at, a, let's say, a conference, or if somebody's doing a systemic another systemic evidence review, doesn't make my paper any less valid. Right. So um, and that's just one example. There are many other rules of evidence that that actually distort the process of scientific discovery and debate in the context of a lawsuit. So, you know, we like to think that 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 uh, the lawsuit that lawsuits are ideal because they force two sides of an issue to bring out their best arguments and their best refutations. And then we have this brilliant lawyer, a judge presiding over the process and determining who's right and who's wrong. Um, but that's a kind of a romantic view from, from, from lay citizens. Anybody who has actually looked at court decisions, knows how these procedures work, um, is likely to understand that, that the a judicial process um, is more often uh, than, than not likely to distort scientific debates, not, not promote them. And so when, when this has happened, let's say, in, in the context of gender, you're saying this is happening everywhere. This is, this is an issue just intrinsic to the system. Right, right. And it's almost been just, it, it's a by the way, if you follow me. Is that right? You mean within, within American public policy, you mean, like yeah. across different policy domains? Yeah, yeah, I think that's true. Um, you know, just to give, give you a more concrete example with these lawsuits um, in Arkansas, Alabama, that pass laws that either um, outright ban uh, and, and criminalize doctors who try to provide pediatric gender medicine or 
um, I try to make take a more indirect approach um, by you know providing um, transitioners with a, a long time to file malpractice lawsuits and stuff like that. Um, courts have blocked uh, have blocked these these laws. They placed what's called a temporary preliminary injunction on them. Um, and what's interesting is that if you look, so uh, you know the Alabama case that came out earlier this year. Um, the tr- the uh, the federal judge who sat in, at the district court level at the, at the trial level is a Trump appointee um, with sympathies to the Federalist Society. So this is not some you know some um, woke activist judge, right? But he still ruled um, that um, that the the state's ban on puberty blockers and cross sex hormones was unconstitutional, or at least uh, he blocked that that ban temporarily. Um, why? You know, there's a number of reasons, but one of them, if you look at the opinion, is that he was deferring because he himself recognized, he says, I'm not an expert on this issue, so I'm, I'm going to defer to what the American Medical Organizations say, the American Academy of Pediatrics. And, and most American medical organizations, which we know are captured on this issue, are in fact, you know, they submitted an, an amicus brief, a friend of the court brief to the, uh, on this case, as they have in all others. And they say all, all available evidence says this is a consensus and that a gender-affirming care is life-saving and medically necessary, blah, blah, blah. We know the line. But, you know, here's a judge, federal judge, saying, look, I'm not an expert. These people are medical organizations. They know what they're talking about. I'm going to defer to them. So, so that's how you get even a Trump-appointed judge agreeing with the ACLU on this issue. And I think this is how we see how you, Lior Zapir, decided to round on the AAP and say, hang on. There are issues here. <laughs> Is that right? Right. So, um, you know, unlike Sweden and Finland and the UK, uh, our, our political system, administrative system, is not set up to do what they did. Um, ours is a lot more decentralized. Um, federalism, separation of power. And, and that means, in part, that means that um, there's just a lot more influence to these um, special organizations, these medical advocacy organizations like the AAP, um, to shape public policy. And these organizations, for reasons we can talk about if you want, but these organizations have largely been captured by a very small but very vocal and well-organized group of activists over the past um, five or six years. Um, and, um, And so to some extent, they are the filter. They're the gatekeepers now. Um, you know, if the a- as long as the AAP, the American Academy of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry, the Endocrine Society, um, as long as these organizations continue to maintain that gender affirming care is life saving and medically necessary against all available evidence, um, it's going to be very, very difficult to get any kind of policy reversal, um, not just because of the courts. But also because, you know, Democrats, right, the Democratic Party, which is the party in power, you know, President Biden and um, Rachel Levin at HHS, uh, officials within the uh, Biden administration, um, they never give arguments. They never cite evidence. They always just defer to the AAP and WPATH and other other organizations. They they just say, we're just we're following them and they're following the science. It's just an assumption. Um, so, so that's right. Until we get reform at the AAP, until we get that organization to be more accountable, um, to not let activists dictate its, its uh, official uh, public recommendations, but to actually do uh, systemic reviews of evidence, to actually follow the science, to consider why you know, Sweden and Finland and the UK have done what they've done, why medical authorities in France are also sounding the alarm bells. Until we get the AAP to back down from its pseudoscientific position, um, it's going to be very difficult to get any kind of policy reversal here. Um, it, it's, it's kind of interesting that you say that for five or six years, because I, I would have thought it was 10 years. I'm interesting that you, you said for the last five or six years, the activists tied it up. And I, I kind of look at, you know, WPATH and Status of Care 7 that came out in 2012 and for me, all roads seem to lead there. And uh, then then I think, yeah, may, maybe you're right. And it, it, for me, all roads lead to the, the chain of trust that Stephen Levine so eloquently talked about. And that we are relying, all of us, anybody who's working, um, you know, in a profession job, we do rely on our chain of trust. Yeah. And they are relying on their chain of trust. Right. And their chain of trust is faulty. Right. And that is the issue. Right, right. So the reason I say five or six in the case of the AAP is just because I'm taking kind of um, 
the Rafferty paper of 2018 that was published in Pediatrics as the benchmark, as the, the kind of the bookmark. Now, of course, it did come out of nowhere, and I'm sure there were, uh, um, you know, th- this was brewing there um, much for much longer. And you know, we can get into kind of the AAP and why I think it's it's um, susceptible to capture, maybe even more so than other medical organizations. But um, you know, in, in 2018, it it al- basically allowed this young doctor who was I can't remember if he was fresh out of his re- residency in psychiatry or was just finishing up at Brown University, you know, very little experience, um, uh, to, to publish this totally fact-free paper. Um, that, you know, James Cantor has since fact-checked to death. I mean, this this paper is just um, absurd on so many levels. Um, but they allowed him to publish it in pediatrics. It passed peer review for reasons I still can't wrap my mind around. And the AAP endorsed it as its official policy position. Um, but you're right. I mean, certainly WPATH goes back much farther than that. Um, um, and since I think, you know, the American Medical Organ- Association, which is the largest American medical group, they, they have, I think, have largely deferred to the AAP, um, WPATH, and um, the Endocrine Society, and the AACAP on this issue. So then, I guess, in your opinion, what will it take to actually change the perspectives of these large organizations that do have such a huge impact on public policy and who do kind of establish that faulty chain of trust? Like, how do we change their perspectives? <laughs> Um, okay, so let me answer that. But first, let me make one more comment, which I think sure. is important here, which is um, one thing that, um, you know, kind of students of American government and public policy know that differentiates America from other countries is that we do a lot of our regulation through what's called adversarial legalism, meaning we use lawsuits or the threat of lawsuits to do what in places like Sweden, Finland, even the UK, they do through central administrative bureaucracies. Um, so, um, so then the question is, okay, so if it's going to be hard to issue these top-down directives like Finland has um, or like Sweden has, you know, what would be the backdoor, the uniquely American way of regulating pediatric gender medicine? And the answer seems to be malpractice lawsuits. If you get a number, you don't even have to have that many. If you get a number of highly visible malpractice lawsuits filed by people who were transitioned and shouldn't have been, and those lawsuits have settlements of tens of millions of dollars or more, um, that is going to send a chill of fear down the spine of hospitals and insurance companies. So, but the problem there is that you need to win in court. <laughs> to, to win, you have to win your malpractice lawsuit and guess who the judge is going to defer to when deciding whether the doctor acted out of medical negligence. That's right, the AAP. So, I mean, even the kind of uniquely American backdoor way of regulating public policy, meaning through the courts, in this particular instance is kind of gummed up because of these organizations. Okay, so so how do we reform the AAP? Um, I think that part, and the answer to that question depends in part on your understanding of what's wrong with the AAP, why things went wrong. So maybe let's let's start there. Um, I think to some extent the story of the AAP is simply a version of the story that we've been seeing unfold in virtually every institution of, of life across the West, in particular, I think, in the academy and in journalism, which is a small number of highly ideological, highly motivated, very well-organized activists um, kind of skillfully setting up a narrative about what's good and bad, just and unjust, and being very, very capable of destroying the professional and personal reputations of people who disagree with them. Um, that's certainly the case with academia. Um, academia has, has now all but purged itself of anybody who's not on, on the left. Um, and that's true of a lot of other institutions in American life. And, and, it's, and, and, and the same problem has not spared the AAP, right? So um, all you need is to have a critical, uh, a, a small minority to basically advance its position and a critical mass of everybody else, meaning the majority of people, to not want to either stick, either not want to stick their neck out. So, you know, if you're a, a pediatrician um, and you are a member of the AAP, 
Um, and you know that if you speak out on this issue and you call BS on what your organization has been doing, um, you're probably going to get, if not fired, you're going to have your reputation destroyed among your colleagues. Um, you're going to be shunned. Uh, you may also get fired from your hospital job, um, your clinic job. So, um, so, so that alone, I think, goes a very long way towards explaining what's happened at the AAP. But I think the AAP is also, um, from what I've understood from talking to pediatricians, um, I think it's also uniquely vulnerable, vulnerable to capture um, because a lot of uh, people go into pediatrics in the first place because they are, uh, this is the way that one of the, uh, one of the doctors I talked to put it, they are bleeding heart doctors. Um, they have kind of an excess of, of empathy, of compassion, so much so that they sometimes let, let it get the better of them and, and it clouds their judgment. And I don't mean to impugn, you know, pediatricians. I know pediatricians who are wonderful, including my kid's pediatrician, who's unbelievable. Um, and I trust her completely. But um, there is, I think, a tendency in this specific field of medicine um, for practitioners to be um, so empathetic um, to, to kids who are suffering through distress that they sometimes let that empathy get the better of their co common sense and good judgment. Which we could clearly say about therapists too, which, uh, but I don't want to derail, but that's such a good point. Yeah. Okay, keep going. So the, yeah. those are some factors that there's these highly vocal activists and then also the bleeding heart type of people that join pediatrics. Right. And then the, I think the third component, which is very important, is its flagship journal, Pediatrics, right? The, uh, which is a peer-reviewed publication, um, you know, there's a few things going on here. Uh, yeah, so pediatrics has allowed Jack Turbin to publish his highly flawed research on their platform. Um, you know, some of his research is just, uh, is just bad, but maybe still good enough to pass peer review. But some of it is just like the, the previous paper that he published on purporting to refute social contagion is just, um, the whole thing is just bogus, um, um start to end. I mean, the, 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 the key assumption that makes his argument even possible, um, he completely fabricated. And you can easily see this by just following the three citations that he gave for it. Which is what? What is the key assumption? That um, on these two uh, uh, um, behavioral surveys, um, CDC behavioral surveys, that when um, the young uh, respondents list their sex, what they mean by that is their natal sex, their biological sex, rather than their gender identity. Mm. Um, and so he used that to show that, look, there are more boys than girls in this category, more biological boys than girls. And because the proponents of social contagion theory assume that it happens mostly to girls, that means that there's no social contagion. So if it turns out that we can't know whether kids who are answering this question are referring to their gender identity or biological sex, then the whole argument falls apart. And in fact, we can't know that. And how do we know that? Not just by following Turbin's own citations, but also because the people who designed the study themselves said, you cannot use this study to, to know if the person is uh, biologically male or female. And even Turbin himself has said that on Twitter, that we have to be careful with the survey because we can't know if people, if a person says I male, if they mean their gender identity or, or biological sex. So, I mean, it, it's not even ambiguous. It's not even a close call. It's just so obvious that he fabricated the data that makes his argument here possible. And the fact that something like this could get beyond a peer review at a high impact journal like pediatrics is a big red flag. Um, so, you know, part of the problem uh, as a political scientist, I think of kind of the, the um, the distrust of institutions is part of the problem why woke activists have taken over them, but they also contribute to the legitimate distrust of institutions. So it's a vicious cycle because now you have the AAP's flagship journal, which who knows how many pediatricians rely on, on um, peer-reviewed publications coming out of pediatrics. You have uh, the, the, the flagship journal um, itself allowing this bogus science to get through its, its gatekeeping function um, because it's politically correct, it's politically convenient for them. Or I should maybe say it would be dangerous for them ideologically and politically not to allow the publication of a paper like this. So, you know, th this is, I think, really truly depressing to those of us who care about science, right? The fact that, that the, 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 the ultimate gatekeepers of knowledge, right, peer review is the only, it's a very imperfect mechanism, but it's the only mechanism that human beings have 
to try to put aside our biases and see with clarity um, uh, what's going on in the world. Um, and you know, it's never it's never a perfect process. It has its inherent flaws, but it's supposed to try to filter out all of the biases that that distort our our understanding of the world. And and if if that process is now itself in service of biases, we are in trouble. Um, I I really think that when we start putting forward the studies that ba- that have propagated and pushed forward gender identity and pediatric transition, very often people come to the conclusion that you've come to, which is this is a terrible, terrible piece of workmanship. This this should never have got any further. And then immediately, just like you said earlier, this is such a compelling subject, you suddenly round on academia and you think it's really, really not covered itself in glory in the last 20 years. I don't know what it was like previous to that, but you could certainly say it feels like we've We've uncovered uh, 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 the, you know, the belly of the beast with academia by delving into what the, the gender studies, and then it suddenly becomes. That's why I think we end up talking about it on and on and on because it feels like it's a a a, a, a piece of thread that we keep on unraveling until suddenly the entire fabric of society seems to be <laughs> seems to be made up of of shoddy workmanship that yeah. we can't rely on. And it is very right. depressing. Yeah. And, you know, let me say kind of one more thing that's, I think, tangentially related to what we're talking about, but, but also I think that broadens the picture a little bit. Um, I'm, I'm starting to see that there's a kind of a collapse of what I would call liberal optimism or liberal faith. And what I mean by that is, if you are a liberal cut in the cloth of, let's say, FDR, right, somebody who believes that... Um, that government, through its regulatory policies, can really improve society um, if you know solve or at least greatly reduce poverty, um, literacy, um, hunger, all these kind of social problems that have afflicted human beings for for ages. If you're that kind of liberal who believes in the power to kind of and I don't I'm not using this word in, in a bad way to socially engineer us into uh, you know a near utopia. Um, I think what you're seeing unravel today in the area of gender and race, the two most kind of salient aspects of our culture war, are really reflective of a collapse of that kind of optimism. Because if you think about it, uh, let me say something about race and then we'll get back to gender. Um, This whole kind of perspective of equity, of we're just going to look at outcomes and if we see any disparities, we're just going to say the whole system is rotten. And we're going to try to fix the rotten system by just kind of tinkering with the outcomes themselves, meaning we just want more African-Americans on college campus and that'll solve discrimination or solve systemic inequity, right? As opposed to let's look at the root causes of why by the time they take the SATs, African-Americans are less academically capable on average, of course, this, these are just averages than let's say Asians. Um, uh, instead of getting at root causes, we're just kind of ignoring those root causes or overlooking them or kind of, you know, kind of um, saying, well, we've despaired, we can't do anything about it. So let's just look at, at final kind of proximate causes and try to re- arrange those in a way that, that, that look nice, that make co- the college campus look diverse. And I think in many ways, what we're seeing now with the uh, trans issue and gender, pediatric gender medicine is actually quite similar to that. And this, I think, is where the two of you can educate me because you, you're much more familiar with this. But it seems to me that this whole idea of a kid declares herself trans and is fast-tracked into hormones is a symptom of the same kind of pathology of thinking, a collapse of liberal optimism. Because what's really going on here is medical professionals saying, you know what, the true causes, I mean, I don't think they're saying this, but I think you know this, right? The true causes of this teenage girl's despair are deep. They have to do with a collapse of meaning in her life. They have to do with with unresolved um, abuse or trauma. They have to do with, um, you know, a lack of a kind of a strong moral framework that used to exist when society was more religious. And I'm not suggesting that we become religious again, but but one benefit of religious societies is that they have strong moral clarity. Um, All of these kind of root causes for human psychological malady, um, it seems to me that the whole pediatric gender transition phenomenon is downstream of our 
uh, unwillingness to confront deep root causes and just address superficial um, consequences of, of, of those things by just transitioning girls and just hoping that, that it'll solve the issue. So I don't, know, I don't know if that accords with your kind of clinical experience. We hope you're enjoying this episode of our podcast. We work very hard to maintain high quality content for this show. And we're grateful to Rhyme and Genspect for supporting us. Rhyme, or Rethink Identity Medicine Ethics, is a nonprofit organization dedicated to improving long term care for gender variant individuals. Visit rethinkime.org to learn more. And Genspect is an international alliance of parents and professional groups whose aim is to advocate for parents of gender questioning children and young people. If you'd like to become a patron, you'll have access to weekly transcripts and special Q&As, and you can join our listener community. Now back to the show. You're pointing out that we are trying to work backwards. We're trying to look at what the ideal outcome would have been had we done that deep work and then just working backwards from there with band-aid solutions and superficial solutions. And it's interesting because I think this is also reflected a little bit in our field, Stella, and I know you and I talk about this a lot, rather than doing the deep work to uncover the distress, our field is quite fixated right now on uh, accommodating, reducing stress, um, making lots of uh, modifications in the expectations of people so that they're less distressed rather than building up their capacity and their strength and their confidence or whatever. So I think you're so right. It's like a, these are all backward solutions. And I, I'm not sure why. Uh, I, I have lots of different theories, but it's a very interesting observation. Yeah, no, I mean that that it that I, I think you put it really well, Sasha. Um, and you know, maybe this is a good segue into the more philosophical issues because that's kind of where we're getting here. But um, I would I would be interested in having a, a, a symposium of psychologists on you know, what what's gone wrong in your field um, because it seems to me, kind of looking at this from the outside, it seems to me that a lot of psychologists. Um, yeah, I could use the term mental health professionals, but that's much broader. But let's just focus on psychology. A lot of psychologists see their role as alleviating subjective distress in the moment and not much more than that. Um, you know, maybe uh, if you want to put it in a more positive way, boosting self-esteem. But the concept of self-esteem at work here seems to be very superficial. It's just kind of uh, unwarranted high regard of oneself. Um, you know, one, one thing that we as human beings want is the confidence that we deserve our self-esteem, right? Yeah. We don't just want to have a good opinion of ourselves. We want to know that we deserve to have this good opinion of ourselves. Because you can't fool yourself. That superficial self-esteem doesn't dig in very deep. Exactly. It doesn't root anywhere. Exactly. Yeah, keep exactly. going. It, it's fleeting, right? Yeah. I mean, it, it's something that, that you can leave the, the counselor's office and, and for a couple of days you'll feel good. And then you go right back because it hasn't worked, right? You haven't really done the work, so to speak. But it seems to me that, that this is kind of where the, the, the profession is. It's that it sees its role as just making people feel good in the moment, short term. And it makes perfect sense why the field would be so vulnerable to trans ideology. Because, you know, essentially what that ideology is, at least when it comes to, to kids, is if it makes you feel good, it's true. Mm. And... You know, there's a powerful strand of American philosophical thought that that top taps into. Um, it's, it's, it, it's known in its, in its technical term as, as philosophical pragmatism. Um, that if something works, it's true. What is true? Whatever works, right? So there's, that's kind of a, it's, it's a very powerful strand of, of American political thinking, of American culture. Um, this idea that if we're too attached to these deep questions of meaning and existence and truth and, and science, um, that'll, that'll make progress more difficult. We have to have a more kind of lighthearted um, approach to, to what's really true and just kind of experiment and see what works. Um, so, you know, th that taps into that strand of thinking. But I think no less important is this kind of non-judgmentalism that we get from the 1960s. And that's become our civic religion. That the only, 
really the only standard that should guide public life, but in this case, I think also medical practice should be non-judgmentalism because to judge is, is, to, is to lower somebody's self-esteem. Um, and it kind of doesn't matter whether the judgment is merited or not, right? Because if everybody deserves to have self-esteem, that's kind of the, the mantra, not just of the therapeutic professions, but I think now of public education too, is that, you know, f uh, the first principle of everything is everybody, all kids should have high self-esteem and everything is downstream from there. Um, and I think that that in practice has led the psychological field to basically say anything that will boost self-esteem is good. Anything that reduces it is bad. And judgment, judging somebody's feelings and choices um, is bad for their self-esteem. And that's, ve that's very destructive. I mean, it's condescending too, right? But it's very destructive because that's not what a therapist is for. A therapist is there to, to reflect you back to yourself and to bring in a, a, a moral and intellectual authority um, to, to kind of to tap into the best that has been thought and said on the kind of struggles that you're going to uh, going through in order to help you get through them in a way that, that makes you grow as a human being, that doesn't just try to give you kind of uh, subjective um, self-satisfaction in the moment. Um, so, so, you know, that kind of non-judgmentalism, and I wrote about this in my, um, in my piece on, on reviewing uh, Matt Walsh's movie, mm. What is a Woman? But... Um, Sorry, I'm, I'm kind of ranting no, here, so feel free going. to... This no, keep going. This is amazing. <laughs> um, uh, no, go ahead. I, I, I'm, I'm fascinated. I, I agree with you. I, 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 I had my issues with my own industry. I, I'm very, I, I'm very un, uncertain in, in talking about it. But more and more, and I think that you and I have kind of gone on a little journey about therapy and just kind of just how often we're hearing so many appalling stories I, I do think we have moved without mindlessly from therapeutic process to therapeutic support. Mm. And we're put in the position. Yeah. yeah. That we're not offering. We are, hopefully, myself and Sasha are offering therapeutic process. But I think an awful lot of therapists, they call it therapeutic support. And immediately, that's not a process. Right. Immediately, <laughs> we have lost something in, in that and I think that has become, it's become parroted out. I don't know. I haven't followed when it started to be said, but it said, even I say it. And I'm like, we, sh we should never have let go of the, the concept of therapeutic process. And then on top of that, the word judgmental. I've always had an issue with what, what's wrong. Surely being judgmental is, is fundamentally good. So I've started <laughs> to say I'm judicious rather than judgmental. <laughs> Because I'm, I've always thought, but surely I'm judgmental about the books I read, about the films I watch, about the food I eat, about the people with whom I, I hang out with. Surely th we are constantly, if we, if we have any sort of engagement in life, we should be judgmental. How that became a bad word is is mind melting for me. Yeah, I know. I, I think you put it beautifully, Stella. Um, I, I mean, it's it, it's it's something that uh, you can't be human in the full sense of the term without constantly judging. To judge yeah. is to be human. To be human is to judge. We're constantly this saying this is better than that, and that impl to judge implies standards and boundaries, right? And boundaries and delineations, which are considered uh, bigoted now. I mean, that that's how right. it's framed. So let, let's kind of, so, so let's call boundaries and delineations, let's subsume that under standards, because okay. that is essentially what, what we're talking about here, right? Mm -hmm. And the, the problem with standards is that then you have to judge the standards themselves. Are they true or false? Um, is there a better or worse way to live? Um, you know, until kind of the, the onset of, of philosophical relativism in the West, um, there, was, there was confidence that there is a right and wrong answer to that question that there's a better and worse way for, for human beings to live. Um, and, and I think for the most part, it was broadly understood that, that Western civilization um, has a good interpretation of that question, right? I mean, not that we never do anything wrong. Of course we do. We, we're capable of, 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 of a lot of injustice. But, but, um, but by and large, you know, we, we, we do think that there are standards and, and those standards should guide how we think and feel and, and interact with one another. Um, but as you know, and this is a different a separate conversation, but a, a part of kind of the, the post-war, you know, kind of a new liberal consensus, the new left consensus is that um, adhering to those standards, defending those standards is uh, as a form of kind of 
ethnocentricity, oppression, colonialism, all these kinds of things. And, and, and that the really enlightened thing for one to do, if one wants to be a liberal, um, wants, one wants to be, so to speak, on the right side of history, is to not um, stand up for those principles, to not stand up for standards. In fact, to, to, to say different cultures have different ways of thinking and feeling, and they're all equally valid. And especially if they're oppressed cultures, they're, they're extra valid and extra, you know, they um, um, should be deferred to even more. So, okay, so just bringing this back to the gender question, I mean, it seems to me that um, a lot of critics, in fact, I'd say almost all critics of pediatric gender medicine, of kind of the more extreme forms of transgender advocacy are using this term gender ideology to describe the thing that they don't like. I use it once in a while too, but I have to say I don't like it. Um, I don't like it for two reasons. Number one, I think there are... Uh, within what's known as gender ideology, there are conflicting philosophical positions, and we can talk about that if you want. Um, it's very difficult to talk about an ideology when the internal ideas of I that ideology reject each other. Um, but the other thing is, I think there's just a much simpler explanation for what we're, why we're seeing what we're seeing, which is that what some people interpret as being non-judgmental, which, as I've said, is kind of our civic religion— is really hmm. just a form of apathy. It's really just people shrugging their shoulders and saying, why should I care? It doesn't bother me personally what you do. Um, I shouldn't care, therefore I'm not going to judge. So it's not tolerance, right? The West is kind of founded on the idea of tolerance. Tolerance means that you understand the beliefs of your neighbor you deeply disagree with them. You may even despise them. You may think that, that he's leading uh, you know, people like, like you and your kids to hell. But you are, you are willing to live alongside somebody like that and allow them to believe what they're believing because, for a variety of reasons, partly because they're going to let you do the same. Right? So tolerance is a very difficult virtue. Um, and, it's, and it's very impressive. Somebody who can truly exercise tolerance is very impressive because it's really hard for human beings to be tolerant in that sense. Whereas apathy is the easiest of virtues. It's not even a virtue. All you have to do is just disengage. And this is something that, you know, Alexis de Tocqueville, that, uh, the, the French philosopher who visited in the 1830s, this is something that he noticed about American society, is that individualism is our quintessential pathological heart condition, right? The, um, <laughs> Uh, we, if, if there's one thing you can say about Americans, um, well, it's not really Americans because he thought we have good correctives to individualism. But if there's one thing that's a kind of a problem for democracy, according to Tocqueville, um, it's, it's individualism, which is a form of apathy. And I think that if you, if you really think seriously about what's going on in this whole question of kind of the transition, why so many people seem to be in support of it, it's not because they've interrogated the ideas. It's not because they've plumbed the depth of Judith Butler. It's not because they, they have, you know, kind of reflected on the science of sex different. No, it's because they just don't see how it affects them personally. So it's much easier for them to just shrug their shoulders and go along with it. And, and that's, not a, that's not a virtue. No. That's a vice. Yeah. And it, this is so obvious in so many areas. I'm thinking, A, about Matt Walsh's film when he's doing those street interviews. And people are basically yes. saying, if somebody else enjoys it, why do you care? And then even exactly. when he was interrogating that guy, that women's studies professor, once he really got under his skin, the only comeback that that guy had was like, why do you care so much about what a woman means? So really, we're right. all being encouraged <laughs> to apathy if we have yeah. any questions about this. And right. that's a very scary place because it means that we're being asked to give up our autonomy to think and to have an opinion and also participate in, in a civic way. And I, I'm really interested in like, as somebody with this political science background, what, do, what happens in a society when people start being apathetic? Like, help me understand historically, what does that typically lead to? What does that mean? Does that mean we're vulnerable to uh, kind of large ideological takeovers? Or like, what happens when a society is full of apathy? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, <clears throat> so, you know, I, I, 
whenever discussing this topic, you have to start and sometimes end with Tocqueville, um, because he is the great theorist, theorist of this problem. And I, by the way, I'm reading Joshua Mitchell right now, who's a oh, Tocquevillian okay. scholar, so, and I'm really yeah, enjoying it. Yeah, okay. he's a very good Tocquevillian mm-hmm, scholar. Mm-hmm. Um, and by the way, for, for any of your listeners who are interested in this topic more, there's a, a, a colleague of mine um, who also got his PhD at Boston College. He did a postdoc at Princeton, a um, brilliant young guy named Jacob Wolf. And he's, um, he writes on Tocqueville um, and tries to kind of bring, bring a Tocquevillian perspective to American um, religion um, and how kind of American Protestantism has produced um, some of the trends that we're talking about. Um, and he has really some really kind of brilliant insights. And so I recommend um, uh, tapping into his work. But I mean, look, to consult Tocqueville, um, you know, for him, the, the, this leads to what he calls soft despotism, right? Which is a, a situation in which uh, you know, it's unlike the despotisms of old. This is not a tyrannical king putting you in jail and torturing you. Um, this is a, a, a situation in which, you know, kind of government takes away, as he puts it, the pains of living, right? Is that you're, it's, it's what we would today call a nanny state. Um, in other words, uh, citizens are reduced to, to, to kind of infantile um, subjects. Um, and, and, and to some, and for Tocqueville, the, the problem here is that we, we, we just, be, uh, any kind of human striving, human excellence, anything that makes life impressive just melts away. Um, but it also means that we are left uniquely vulnerable to, as you put it, Sasha, to ideological takeover, right? Because when citizens are apathetic, when they don't see that, that there's any need for them to, or, or any capacity for them to shape public life, culturally, politically, um, you know, that seeds a lot of room for demagogues to step in, which was the um, worry of the American founders, right? For them, um, monarchy was only one evil. The other was pure democracy. Pure democracy paves the way f- uh, for demagogues and, uh, and, and dictatorships. Um, so an apathetic citizenry seems to me the quintessential precondition for that kind of, um, for, for a loss of, of, a, of, a, of a really important kind of freedom. Um, so, you know, I mean, we can go on and on here, but, but let, me, let me just kind of circle back to the gender I- ideology question, <clears throat> because I think it's important um, that, that when people use this term, they be accurate about what they mean. And it seems to me that there's two philosophical positions that march under this umbrella. Um, one is what is often called queer theory. It's often poorly characterized. Um, but broadly, queer theory is kind of this, this idea that, uh, you know, if, uh, to take our, our cues from Foucault and Judith Butler, um, that science itself is a kind of, as they put it, a discourse, that there's no real way to know reality, that it's all just kind of linguistic games that cultures play. Um, uh, you know, as Judith Butler puts it, that the, there's, no, there's no males and females, there's no men and women, it's just all socially constructed through and through. Um, and, um, and, and so interestingly, from the perspective of queer theory, um, and it's all, you know, it's all kind of against the concept of nor- anything normal is immediately criticized, right? Uh, so from the perspective of queer theory, if you think about it, the vast majority of transgender people are every bit as conformist as people like us. In fact, even more so, because they go through all these pains to, um, to uh, want to appear as typical, meaning stereotypical, male and female. Um, the true kind of revolutionaries, the true uh, minority of people, the vanguard of the revolution, the people who are, whose consciousness has really been raised, who can see reality for what it is, are the ones who, as Butler puts it, perform gender, because gender is not something we are, it's something we do. Um, people who perform gender in ways that kind of thwart social expectations, um, that offend cultural sensibilities, so the non-binary, the, right, the, the gender queer, all these kind of proliferating identities and, and pronouns, neo-pronouns and all that. So that's, the, that, that's what we should aspire to. Those people are truly authentic. Everybody else is just a conformist. Um, so that's one understanding of gender ideology. Um, and I should point out that that understanding of gender ideology, gender ideology is deeply hostile to science because it sees science as just kind of politics by other means. It's deeply hostile, especially to medical science. Um, 
and it's 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 hostile to any kind of essentialism, any idea that our sex um, or who we really are in terms of male, female, and, or anything else is somehow kind of located within uh, within us and can be discernible through the, the tools of rational science. Okay, so that's one position. The other position that marches under the gender ide- ideology label is the exact opposite of that. It says that every human being has an innate, immutable gender identity, that that gender identity is a kind of the psychological outgrowth of brain sex. I mean, that's if you read kind of law review articles and and a lot of um, scholarship that promotes um, gender self-identification, they say it's all neurological. It's all based in the brain. Some people are born with the brain of a bo- the brain of one sex, the body of another, and that we know this through objective science and all these kinds of things, right? And of course. Um, in, in the policy realm, everybody and their mother who is making pronouncements on gender identity is always saying the science this says this, the science says that. Any, anytime somebody says the science says, they are already outside of queer theory and they are in, in diametrically opposed to it. So these are not just two variations of gender ideology. They are radically in opposition to one another. One of them vehemently rejects the other. And in fact, if you read Judith Butler... Um, there's a very interesting um, article that she wrote in 1988. So if anybody has read Judith Butler, you know that she's inscrutable. It's, it's almost impossible to understand her. You have to read her over and over and over again. And, and it's intentionally so, I think, she, she writes like that. But there's actually one article she wrote from 1988 that's um, remarkably clear by her standards in which she explains, she basically lays out her theory of what does she mean by gender as a performance. And in that article, there's some very interesting passages that apply to our situation today because she calls gender identity and the exact meaning that it, that kind of trans activists have in the public sphere, so ACLU, the Biden administration, she calls that understanding of gender identity a, quote, regulatory fiction. And you can see why, from the perspective of queer theory, that would be the case, Right. It's 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 a fiction because there is no essence that we can know in that way, that gender is is something that we do, not something that we are. Um, And it's regulatory because believing that gender is innate and immutable in that way lends itself to these oppressive power structures that that kind of tell us what we can and cannot do, that that create systemic violence and all these other kind of buzzwords that postmodernists like. So that's why, you know, (laughs) So I guess the, the, what I'm trying to say to kind of step back here is that I don't, I'm not a huge fan of gender ideology as a concept to try to explain what's going on for two reasons. One of them being is that um, there's just a simpler explanation, which is this unhinged empathy, non-judgmentalism, or if you want to be, I think, really clinical about it, apathy, um, uh, which is a vice. But at the same time, even if we are to take the ideas of gender ideology seriously, we immediately see that they are complete in complete self-contradiction with one another. Um, and it's hard to see how an ideology like that can shape public policy. Now, of course, it does shape public policy. You know, I get a lot of pushback from people who are opposed to it saying, oh, you don't recognize the importance of gender. No, no, I do recognize the importance of gender ideology. It's very important. Um, it plays a huge role in, in producing the kind of perverse outcomes that we see today. But my point is that when talking about these things, we have to be precise in naming what it is that we're talking about. We have to have clear and precise ideas in our head. And we also have to recognize when gender ideology is not doing all the work in producing a certain outcome. Um, is, is, a few things to say here. Um, I, I hear you about gender ideology not fitting. I'm surprised you don't just convert it to gender ideologies. <laughs> and that might, that might, you know, make your point. But but I, I think our kind of people who, who kind of work from where we come from in, in this kind of debate and discussion, we suffer a lot for not having catchy phrases that we, 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 we really could do with some slogans. I know that um, people would say that our points are too complex for them to be distilled, but I think it's essential I think if you look at a- any campaign, if you don't have good slogans or campaign phrases, you you won't get the the general public. And I I think we need to, frankly. And you know, down with gender ideology doesn't cut it. 
<laughs> as you've as you've already explained. But I'd love somebody to come up with some some great phrases that people could but get behind. Because I think honestly, 80, 85% of people, of the ordinary people, if they knew what we were discussing in our contorted, complicated ways, would say, Yeah, 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 no, I, I think you know, childhood pediatric medical transition is it's too heavy, it's too early, it's it's too it's a sledgehammer to crack a nut. And we, we, you know what I mean? So it, I feel we've really lost our way as, as a movement that we haven't come up with really strong slogans that could be easily got behind. I really do. Yeah, I, I perfectly agree with that. I mean, l- let me put it this way. Maybe I hope you agree. Um, those who are promoting uh, this kind of extreme gender affirming care paradigm have all PR and no science, whereas yes. we have all the science and no PR. Yeah. Um, I mean, it seems to me that, that that's a bit of an oversimplification, but, but that, in, in, in essence, is, is, is what you're saying, and I completely agree. But let, 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 before we get there, let, let me just say one last thing about queer theory, which is that, um, interestingly, if you really kind of read the, the text and think about the ideas, um, it's hard to think of a philosophical position that should be more against pediatric gender We say transition this all the time. Than queer theory. Oh, no. Yes. Yes, right? mind blown. <laughs> well, I, I think there is a kind of, and, and this is the thing about all of this. I mean, I, I'm going to ground this in like what I know best, which is like one-on-one conversations with dysphoric teens. And what you realize is they hold incredibly contradictory, almost schizophrenic views about this. And they get tongue-tied. They're not sure how to kind of parse out these weird beliefs such as I was born in the wrong body, but also I'm deconstructing the gender binary. It's totally illogical and it doesn't actually meld. So I think it just, um, I think you might have said this, or I remember somebody talking about this and, and I've said this, these, con- these ideas are confusing, I think, on purpose. Because that's what leads to apathy. If you look at a set of beliefs that are contradictory to one another and you ask, let's say, because it's always about asking the marginalized people for themselves what they think. And so you have a confused 18 year old spouting a bunch of crazy nonsense. You know, people think, well, obviously, I'm not the expert in this. I'm going to take a step back and let the, uh, you know, marginalized people themselves or the experts lead the way. So it's totally contradictory messaging. But people... Uh, you have done a really good job of clearly delineating what these ideas are, but the young people who are just kind of imbibing all of this, they don't know what's what. Right, right. And, and can I, before you come in, Leo, can I add, somebody made this point, it was such a good point, like, you know, the emperor's new clothes, it wasn't diktat from the state. It was, if you're clever, you will you will see the, the, the emperor's new clothes. And so that really <laughs> leads into it. If you follow me, it was genius. Yeah. That, that story yeah. showed that, that it wasn't. It was kind of, oh, the clever people will see it. But, oh, that, oh. but that, I mean, so what you're saying, Stella, is really a feature of, I think, um, well, I'll say it because I think it's true, of Marxist thought and all of its offshoots, right? That, that there's this kind of small um, uh, clique of, of intellectuals who alone... Um, see through the veil of ideology to, to, the, to, the, to the reality as it truly is. Um, and you can see why this manner of thinking is so uh, appealing um, to, obviously, to intellectuals, but, but also to teenagers who are, you know, all they want to do is not conform. All they want to do is forge their own individuality. And if here you present them with kind of a, a, a body of ideas, even if it's totally incoherent, that allows them to believe that they alone see through the veil of adult ignorance and ideology um, to the truth of the matter. Um, You know, somebody asked me on a podcast once if I'm shocked by the fact that 20% of um, Gen Z, of teenagers today, identify as LGBTQI++, right? Um, And my response is something to the effect of, no, I'm shocked that it's not 100%. Yeah, (laughs) I know. That's what's truly shocking to me. I mean, if... (laughs) If you're a teenager and you and you say, you know what, I'm perfectly happy being cisgendered, heteronormative, all these kinds of things, you're insane. What's wrong with you? <laughs> yeah. Um, how could you not want to be one of these, you know, super um, uh, fancy, <laughs> like uh, unique, you know, snowflakes, right? I mean, snowflakes is 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 the unicorns. Wrong word. I shouldn't have said it. Maybe unicorns. Okay. Unicorns, right? Um, 
how would you not want to be? I mean, some, what's wrong with you? Um, so, you know, the fact that, that, that uh, an unprecedented number of teenage girls are identifying as non-binary. That's not um, the shocking is, part. <laughs> is totally, uh, if you understand what it is that they're really saying, they're not saying, I've read Judith Butler and I agree with her. They're saying, I don't want to be fit in as a two-dimensional stereotype. I haven't made up my mind. I'm still developing. I'm still, I'm my own person. I know that you have all these traditions and concepts, but let me be who I am. That's all they're saying. And it just, we're giving them a language in which to say it. It's a language of postmodern gender theory. We're giving them that language. And I think what's really disturbing is that when they start speaking in that language, the medical establishment steps in and saying, okay, now that has medical implications. So, so we're taking kind of natural tendencies among teenagers, we're supercharging them with ideas, with ideas that leak out of the academy, and then the medical establishment swoops in and medicalizes their um, natural teenage behavior. Um, and that's what I think that that's what's really troubling. But uh, to get back to your point, Stella, about the language. Um, yes, this has been a real I mean, this is this is true of a lot of kind of um, um, concepts of wokeness, that it's it's extremely good PR. Um, right. Think of equity. It sounds like equality. And anybody who's opposed to equity, that means that you're opposed to equality, which, and, you know, again, to invoke Tocqueville, the only thing that you're not allowed to be opposed to in a democracy is equality. It's the one principle that, that, that kind of serves as, as, the, as, as the legitimating principle of everything else. So, um, so if you're against equity, you must be, uh, you, you know, you, your opinions can't count in a democracy. Um, if you're against equity. But of course, we know anybody who is kind of in the know, and here I don't want to sound cultish ourselves, but anybody who's in the know knows that equity and equality are not just different, they're the opposite. Um, but we don't have good campaigning around that, right? So it's very easy for people to fall into that trap. And I think the same thing with gender affirming care. Um, who could be against affirming? It sounds like the most wonderful, compassionate, kind, non judgmental thing to do. Um, who could be against care? Mm -hmm. What are you, yeah. a moral monster that you're against <laughs> affirming care for kids? I mean, yeah. it's insane. Life-saving, so, mind you. Yeah. Life-saving affirming and life -saving care. And life-saving and medically necessary, mm -hmm. right? I mean, all these buzzwords that, that, were, that, that, that are just... I trust the science. Yeah, I trust the, the science. science. So, so just mm -hmm. kind of, they're repeated ad nauseum, right? Um, and, and they're just like, they're, they're just, uh, they, they wash our public sphere. It's like a flood you hear it day in, day out in the media, on NPR, uh, radio, um, you, you read it everywhere. It's, it's, it's on everybody's lips, affirming care, affirming care, affirming care. And when you hear these concepts over and over and over again, you just think naturally that they refer to something real, to something, to, to something proven. And there's nothing behind them, right? So, so then the question is, how do we, how do we undo that? Um, and, and let me add a, a, a caveat, a complication here. And that is, how do we do that without creating a kind of race to the bottom of populism, of vulgarity? How do we do that while also making the case that, no, these are complicated issues. They require careful analysis and deliberation, rational debate, um, uh, you, you know, uh, analysis of, of science. Um, because what we don't want to do is turn everything into kind of a, uh, you know, a cable news um, a breaking news type of headline thing, right? We, we don't want this to just devolve into, you know, they have their slogans and we have ours and whichever side happens to shout loudest uh, is the side that wins. That's not healthy for anyone. That's not going to be conducive to, to science, to good medical ethics. Um, but, but, it, but in the short term, we do need to have concepts. We do need to have language that recapture common sense and, so and, and sanity on this issue and, you know, I've, I'm part of groups that we're, we're constantly thinking of, of better terms. And I hate to say, but it's, it's very difficult. Um, you know, I've heard like synthetic sex identities. Okay, yeah, that's good because synthetic kind of um, hints in the direction that, that we want people to think, which is that this is heavily medical. You're becoming a lifelong ward of the medical establishment. Mm -hmm. um, and then it's not really, right? it's, it's synthetic, but, but then it has the word identities in it. And anything with the word identity is just 
explosive. Sh- should we be body affirmative? They're gender affirmative. I think, I think that's a much, much better term. So, so body, body affirming care would be the exact opposite of gender affirming care. Body affirming care is, is psychotherapy that has as, as its main goal to help kids in distress feel comfortable in their bodies. Um, you know, get it out there, Stella. Okay. <laughs> well, we'll, we'll keep thinking about it. I mean, there's, there's so many places <laughs> this could, could go right now that I have on my mind, but maybe I'll just keep that for another time. It's been so fascinating to talk to you. I feel like I'd love to have you back on. This is I'd great. love to come back. I, I, I love this podcast. This is by far and away the best podcast on all issues gender. Oh, I'm thank I'm you. To be here. That's such a kind thing to say. You're, you are so Wait, knowledgeable. And I really enjoy having having you on because you have this broader perspective. There are these bigger questions about yeah. how different organizations and institutions intermingle with the civic view on these issues. Like there's so much here and it's been fantastic. So we, we'd love to have you back on if you're willing to come. Great, great. Absolutely. Well, thank you, Lior. Thanks a million. Thank you. Thanks for joining us this week on Gender, A Wider Lens. This podcast is sponsored by Rhyme and Genspect, and listener support means a lot to us. The best way to help is to subscribe and review us on iTunes. Follow us on social media, and if you'd like to become a patron, you'll have access to weekly transcripts of the show, special Q&As, and you can join our listener community. Just go to our link tree. That's linktr.ee slash widerlenspod. Our discussions are for educational purposes only and are not intended as a substitute for mental health services.